So today's topic is back to home. Back to home, not back to school, back to home. You have spent your whole summer, hopefully, if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, playing, going to watering holes, having ice cream, being out on your back deck, playing a lot of video games with your children unrestricted, doing the things that say summer to your family. And one of the great reliefs of summer is you can just like let go, right? You can allow yourself to temporarily disengage from the pressure you feel to make your children learn, right? You can temporarily just trust that life is going to be enough for this season. You don't have this nagging feeling in the back of your head like, what about math? What about spelling? What about handwriting? You're able to just engage in the life that you share with your family. And what I wanna do today is talk a little bit about that. Talk about home, hominess. How can we borrow some of that summer energy into the fall? even while the fall energy is awesome because fall energy helps you. You notice how in the fall, everybody sort of knows that there's a back to studies moment, but you're at home, you're not in a classroom. You know, I've steadfastly resisted images of yellow pencils and school buses and apples in Brave Writer because I didn't wanna connote that we were bringing school into our families. You know, I'd much rather you think of flowers or teacups or a funky teapot, right? Little personalized teapots, one for each child. Wouldn't that be amazing? What can you do to reinforce the properties of home as you reignite the school year, as opposed to reinforcing a faux style school? Do you hear what I mean? You could, for instance, what I used to do on the school first day of school mornings, is I would write a personal note to each of my children. Now, I have discovered by going through their drawers and dressers after they move out that they kept those. They weren't big. Often they were just a little note card with a note from me. I would write things like, can't wait to explore Greek mythology with you. So excited to watch you rock climb. We're gonna have a great year learning all the Latin roots because I know how much you love vocabulary. Uh, the books I have on our list are these. I would write like this little short, this is gonna be an awesome year kind of note with a little preview, a little rubbing of their egos, massaging of the egos, a little lovey-dovey connection. And then I would give them some kind of a little gift, maybe just muffins for breakfast. I was never a big, production person. I, I'm not as gifted that way. That's not my bend to create gifts. But I would try to do something with writing and make the table special. A couple years we had balloons. You know, I'd mixed it up. But that was my way of signaling we're starting to shift out of summer mode into some of those things we associate with education. But I still want it to be homey. I still want it to be connected. I still want it to feel pleasurable to you just like swimming at the Y felt pleasurable to you. Make sense? So one of the things that I did is I collected a few items at this table that I'm going to show you um, that I thought might be fun to include in your family this year. So the first one, of course, are these amazing English tea store little mini pots. And you can get them, they always come solid color, but I get multiple and then we mix and match the lids with the teapot. These are great for individual teas at Poetry Tea Time. So if you've got kids, one likes herb tea, one likes black tea, one wants root beer, <laughs> put it in their own teapot and then they have control over how much they drink. Uh, Nadine Dyer, our Canadian to the North neighbor, she was a big tea salesman and after she did all these Poetry Tea Times, one day her son, while struggling with math, said to her, I think math would go better with tea. And she was like, why didn't I know this? Why didn't I think of this? So she went and got him his own little teapot. And this is my second tool for your home, candles. Kids love candles. They like to do this. Can I show you? This is what they like to do. Woo, 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 right through the flame, right? They like to light them and extinguish them. So consider adding some candles to your life. A little teapot and a candle might completely change the attitude around math. Not kidding, try it, find out. You might try candles and copywork. That's what we did in our family. 
I started with one candle, but everybody wanted a turn putting their finger through the candle flame and they all wanted to put it out. So we went to tea lights in little tea light cups, like, you know, little votive candle holders. And then they could light them and unlight them as often as they wanted while they did their copy work. There is something about just that extra incentive of coziness that helps your kids feel at home. I've shared many times that home is about relaxing. Think about it. When you come home from being away from home, what do you do? What's the first feeling you have when you walk through the door? <sighs> I just got home from being out of town. The first thought I had was, oh, I'm home. I don't have to worry about where I take off my shoes. I can leave some stuff on the table. I can walk straight to the refrigerator, get myself something to drink. I don't have to ask permission. I don't need a map. I'm not following a schedule. I can decide to brush my teeth now or later. Home is about letting go of obligation and pressure. It's the place you get to show up as yourself. So when we mix in the properties of school, what happens is we're actually violating that right sense of home that your kids have already imbibed. They've already picked it up. They grew up here. So you say to them, sit down at the table, do math, and they're like, you know, they just want to relax. They're at home. So how do we bring these together? How do we help our kids stay on task and yet experience the feeling of freedom and peace and comfort that home provides all of us? Well, one way is we include hominess in the experience. You know, we make the table pretty where we're doing homeschool. We don't just clear it off and turn it into like a sterile clinic. We actually invite a little bit of enchantment. We decide to strew something they're not expecting. New colored pens, different colored paper, a candle. We might just rub their shoulders before they start. Say, okay, before we start today, everybody make a chain. We're gonna do this shoulder rub chain to this music. And you just put on music. And then everybody turns and they shoulder rub the other way and they, and they listen to music. And then you do your 10 minute lesson. And then you pause and you do another body break. In other words, you start to incorporate into your routine those things that remind your kids, hey, I'm at home. I'm not being marshaled around by a teacher, by a classroom schedule. I mean, my goodness, even third graders have to have a hall pass just to pee. At home, they can go whenever they need to. If they get hungry, they don't have to wait for recess. They can go get a snack. We want to encourage that. Now, I know it's possible some of you who imagine eventually that they're gonna put their kids into the school system or like, but they've gotta learn it. But they're not gonna learn it at home. You know where they learn how to fit into the system? In school. If you want them to learn the school system, put them in school, because that's where it happens. It feels artificial at home. It's like your playing house. It's like you're playing school. Remember when you were eight or nine and you'd have your friends over and you'd say, we're gonna play school and you'd, you'd you know, argue over who got to be the teacher because obviously that's the only person with power. And then all the other kids would sit at this little makeshift, you know, table and then they would do their work, but no one really did work. They would be class clowns or they would write silly notes to their boyfriends, but they didn't really do work. That's what homeschool feels like when you bring school to home. It's like, why am I doing this? Oh, it must be a game. Oh, we must be playing school. Your kids sort of treat you that way. They're like, but can I jump rope in the middle of school? Is it okay if I like fall off the chair and say I don't want to? What happens when I do that? You know, in school, they don't take that stuff. They don't tolerate it. You get punished, you get shamed, you get blamed, you stay in from recess, your parents get told, your grades go down, you're given extra work. I mean, is that the life you wanted to create for your kids at home? I don't think so. So if you want home to be more like school, then you have to use the school measurement and punishment system so that they will know, oh, I've got to behave here. This is a space that requires this of me. But when you do that, you do undermine the properties of your home. You start to turn home into a place people don't really like being. And to be honest, home is the place everyone should like being. Everyone should like being at home. You know, think of Dorothy. <laughs> All she wanted to do was get home. She went from Kansas, gray, black and white movie style life 
to Technicolor, Ozland, and all she wanted was to be home. Why? Because she had to be on her toes in the Wizard of Ozland. You know? She didn't have to be on her toes at home. She could just be. You know, her parents sent her outside. She walked on top of the, you know, fence. She fell in with the pigs. You know, <laughs> she just had life. Life was home. Home was life. They're the same thing. As you're thinking then about your kids and about turning this year into something a little more charming, a little more inviting, a little more delighting, enchantment, enchantment could be defined as startling your children into delight, surprising them into delight. As you think about that, draw on the properties of home, not school. Don't buy them yellow school bus pencil pouches. One of the most amazing experiences all homeschool families have is what? The UPS truck arriving with a box of books. How many of you know that experience? The box of books and your kids open it and they get to find out what they're reading this year. They get to see this crisp brand new workbook without a single pencil stroke in it yet. And they get to hold it and smell that new book smell. You know, they don't have that in school in quite the same way. They get distributed a bunch of textbooks that the last six years have already used and names are already written in them. But that's not your life. Your life is a truck arrives with a present and that present happens to be new books. Who knows what I'm talking about? Who knows what I'm talking about? So I want you to think about this notion that you have jurisdiction over this space. You don't only have to be a book person. Yes, read books, my goodness. These are all the arrow books, by the way. We teach all 10 of these this year in our arrow program. And you could be reading these. You could be in our Facebook group. Once you buy the whole year for the arrow, you can join our free Facebook group and talk about party ideas. Every single one of the arrows this year has suggestions for how to throw a party that coordinates with the book. Every one. Esperanza Rising is the one for September. And literally, she talks about getting a pinata. What child wouldn't want a pinata? Mary Wilson's our party girl, and she's doing all the party school this year for our arrows and our boomerangs. So you need a little more home? How about throwing parties every time you read a book? Not doing a book report. Book report? School. Parties? Brave writer. <laughs> home. Home party. And will there be learning? Oh, my friends. Oh, my friends. That's when learning happens. The book report is what you do to get done so you can relax at home. The book report is what you do so you can get done to relax at home. The book report is what you do to get done so you can finally relax at home. Okay, that's not what you do. That's not who you are. You read this amazing book. You sip tea. You light a candle. You sit back, comfy. You pull up, you know, a blanket if you need it. You laugh and stop and pause as you're reading. And then because there are so many Spanish words in this book and unplanned, you hadn't thought about it in advance, but you're reading along and you keep seeing these Spanish words, you think, hey, when we're done, let's just go look these all up and see what they mean and see if we can make words out of them, uh, sentences on our refrigerator. I'm just going to use post-it notes. We're going to write all these words and we're just going to make up really bad Spanish sentences that aren't quite right, but that use as many of, those, of the words as we want. And we're going to leave dad a message and see if he can figure it out. And then... Later in the week, we're going to get a pinata and we're going to stuff it with candy, but we're going to wrap the candy in Spanish words and everybody's going to have to unwrap the candy and read the Spanish words. Do you hear what I'm saying? That's what you get to do at home. There's no do the book report so I can finally be at home. It's I'm already at home. What advantages does home give me that I don't get when I'm out in the school mindset that school kids don't get? We had a not back to school party every year for our co-op here in Cincinnati. And you know where it met? At the pool. One of our members 
was a member of a local like pool swimming club. And she would rent it out on the first day of public school every year. And all the homeschool families were invited to go swimming. And we'd have this big swim party because we weren't going back to school. We could go to the pool on the first day of school. I bought Disney annual passes one year for my kids when we lived in Orange County so that we could go as many times as we wanted in the fall when no one travels because school is serious in the fall. You know how much we did based on that experience of going to Disneyland. That's when we got into frontier life. We threw our gold rush party. We watched Pocahontas. We studied all of the Lewis and Clark journey, the Native American tribes all because we could not get enough of Frontierland at Disneyland. It catalyzed all that interesting learning. Do you hear what I'm saying? I'm looking at your comments. Exactly, what advantages do you have at home? What is available to you? Could you take a break? You know, I was talking about this a little bit this morning with my staff. Home isn't just about activity, it's about comfort. So what makes you feel more comfortable? Think about the things that bring comfort into your life. Is it a snack? Is it someone rubbing your feet? Is it someone holding your hand? You know, maybe your child is at that stage where she needs you to sit right next to her for every word she writes. I know you don't want to. I know it feels unrealistic and you're thinking this eight-year-old is gonna be 18 someday and she has to be able to write without someone sitting next to her. I promise, if you sit with her for this year, she might just make it to 18 without needing you. When we used to teach our kids to do their own laundry and we used fourth grade as the year. Fourth grade's the year you learn to do your own laundry. We did it with our children every time for a year. So for a year, you would once a week bring your laundry downstairs and I'd go with you and we would do it together. I didn't just show them twice and say, now you're on your own. No, we did it for a year. I helped them put in the laundry detergent. We sorted whites and darks. I pointed out when something really wasn't a white or when something really wasn't a dark. Uh, I helped them set the timer and understand like clothes that should be dried by hand. Of course, none of my kids believed in that. So <laughs> everything they bought shrunk. But for a year, we did it together. And when the year was up, I'm like, okay, guess what? You're on your own. You get to do your laundry yourself. And guess what that meant? I didn't enforce doing laundry. I also never had to do laundry. So some of my kids loved doing laundry, had clean clothes. Some of my kids would go months without doing laundry. And occasionally I might grab an outfit and wash it for them if I knew we needed it for a wedding or something. But literally it became theirs because that's what independence actually is. Independence is them doing it on their own and you're out of the equation. There's no such thing as independence under supervision with your parent. So my contention is you're not actually raising them to be independent by task mastering them into something. What you need to do is spend the appropriate amount of time partnering with your children so they can take over and you can walk away. And if you aren't ready to walk away, they shouldn't be marshaled into doing things alone. They should still have you. You know, even in school, kids don't do things independently. They're in classes with 25 to 40 children and an instructor every ding dang day, talking with them, urging them along, prodding them, rewarding them, punishing them to keep them going. They're not independently learning. Are you kidding? Your kids are doing so much more independent learning just by living at home without you hovering all the time than most public school kids will ever do because all of their hours are accounted for. So this myth of independence that they should sit at the table and follow a school schedule without your supervision is a myth. It isn't school and it isn't home. It's some weird hybrid thing that homeschoolers came up with because they're tired. I get it. <laughs> I'm tired too. So that's why we have to make it homier. So we won't be so tired, we'll be re-energized and we'll feel comfortable to be there. Hmm. drinking my tea. One of the things that 
Okay, so Rachel is asking, how does that look when you have high schoolers and youngers too and you want this lifestyle, but they need to be home doing all the school stuff? So conversations with your children. Hey, big people who are in high school now and who are not going to public school or private school, you want to go to college, it sounds like. Here are some things that I would like to supervise. You know, let's make a plan. I think it'd be great if you read these books over the course of the year. How many pages a month do you think you can handle? How many books in the year? Which books do you want to read? Here's my group. Here's the group you want. How can we organize this? How can we work our check-ins? Shall we check in on Fridays? Should we have a morning powwow each day at, for 10 minutes? And then I'm available. If you need me, you call me over. Or maybe we work on this one subject together, but the others you do on your own, but under supervision. You collaborate around this huge transition and then you make it clear i've got younger kids who need the same devotion and attention i gave you when you were eight and ten so now i do expect you to be able to work alone not necessarily independently but to work alone for a little while at a time each day without me sitting next to you going hey problem number two problem number two yeah that's okay i want a high schooler to write the first draft without the parent transcribing it. That has to happen. But set up a structure where there's check-in and you're not resentful that the child isn't just taking the classical education program and running with it without ever talking to you about it. The greatest pleasure in learning is conversation. Not writing, not thinking. It's engaging another mind, having meaningful exchanges. So you got to check in with those high schoolers. And I, I, I don't I, I was about to say something, and I'm going to say it, but I want to preparatory it, pre prepare you for it, <laughs> my language. I had five kids. Some of you have had seven, eight, 10, 11 kids. It's not possible to homeschool successfully in the same level of devotion and energy for 11 children as someone who has two or three kids. It's just not. You are going to have to triangle in help. You're gonna need online classes, co-ops, part-time enrollment at the local high school, maybe even some kids going to school. 11 kids at 11 levels needing all your supervision, that's a lot. I'm just gonna say it. Because your children deserve a rich academic life. They don't deserve to be shamed for not being willing to sit at a table by themselves all day every day because you have so many kids. That was your choice and my choice, not theirs. They didn't choose to be in a family of eight children. They were just born. That was your choice. So our choices, we need to take responsibility for and help them get what they need. You know, help them get what they need. And you can do that this year by focusing on the properties of home, even for your high schoolers, setting up some kind of experience that lets them know you aren't just resentful <laughs> that they're not doing their schoolwork. Do you see what I mean? So often when parents say, I want my child to be independent, they are coming from such a defensive posture. The only thought in their minds is, I don't have time, not I really want to see her grasp and own her education. Because if they felt that, they would already know that true independence, this total freedom to do it on their own is not what they're after. The academic community is not about solo journeys. It's dialogue, it's the great conversation, it's engaging your peers, it's writing to be read. It's not filling out forms and giving grades and filing them in the homeschool tomb where nobody ever reads them. That's not a good education. I'm just gonna say it right now. So as you're preparing this year, think enchantment, you know, tea is always good. You might also, um, I'm gonna grab a couple more things I put on the side here. These are very brave writery, but I'm, I, you know, this is brave writer, I'm gonna promote them. You might need something for you. My books, A Gracious Space, the fall, winter, and spring, they don't wear out. There's 50 essays in here, and you can read one each morning to recenter you and help you stay the course and not slide back into schoolish thinking. Yeah, you've got objectives. I want your kids to learn to write and read. I got a call recently from someone whose 14 year old isn't reading and she's been too afraid to get him tested. That's not good. We want a 14 year old reading or to be tested and getting the therapy he needs. 
We can't just keep blaming our kids for not being independent. You took on the task of educating. You wanted to do this. You want to be home and be the primary teacher in their lives. Since that's the case, do it. Enjoy it. If you're not enjoying it, you got to reevaluate because your kids deserve an enjoyable life at home. They deserve an enjoyable education. And oh my gosh, we have a million ways to help you have that. That's what these Facebook Lives are. That's what this book is for. That's what the Homeschool Alliance is for. Go to coachjuliebogart.com if you want a community. Tonight we're talking about how to enter a child's perspective on our webinar. And that perspective helps you see the world the way they do. You know, it's not enough to just say, hey kid, go do your schoolwork. You didn't do it, I'm upset with you. What is it about the schoolwork right now that's making them revolt? Why aren't they drawn to a page of math problems? Well, is it that the math problems have not yet become compelling? How do I make them more compelling? I don't know. You're a creative person, or maybe you're not a creative person, but you are a person who knows what makes people happy. You know what makes you happy, start there. Maybe you would have enjoyed math more if somebody was playing Yahtzee with you and counting that way, or learning to play poker. Or maybe you're just gonna count everything in your house and then you're gonna randomly subtract things from all the things you've counted. Maybe you're gonna always do the math problems on the wall with chalk as opposed to on a sheet of paper. I mean, there's a million ways to do math. It doesn't have to be confined to a book. And yeah, there's maybe some book work you want done. So can you season the book work? Can you say, okay, we're gonna give eight minutes. We're gonna do an eight minute blast at math. And we're gonna just rip through as much as we can in eight minutes and then we're done. We're gonna eat a cookie. We're gonna jump on the trampoline. We're gonna do jumping jacks. You know, like how can you do it so that you honor both things? Yes. Um, so the first thing is help yourself. The other way to help yourself is more videos of me, of course. <laughs> we're almost out of these, actually. I, these are all the main talks I give at conferences, and I've kind of moved on now to new talks because I've done these so much. If you want my core talks, Nurturing Brave Writers, How to Be an Ally, Coach, and Partner to Your Child, How Do You Implement the Brave Writer Lifestyle, what would it look like if you had your fantasy homeschool? How can you get more of that going? And finally, how to help your high schoolers. Six hours of video right here, DVDs. You can get them in MP4s, digital download, or buy these hard copies. Invite your friends over, have a back to home party with all your best buds, and get some of your group to share the same values as you so that you can call each other and say, hey, let's go outside and have a picnic and um, make Moroccan bread and drink mint tea and talk about, you know, the Near East. What about that? We're going to call each other and say, hey, let's do a park day where we all throw javelins because we're studying, you know, the Olympics and I want to talk about how to throw javelins and I need some partners. You need friends like that. This will help you. Get them on the same page as you. Okay. The other things I wanted to show you this book here, Making Thinking Visible, we use some of these articles in the Homeschool Alliance. And next month, I'm thinking, I haven't even told Stephanie this, but I think we talked about drawing from here again. These are practical ways to bring the thinking part of learning into your family life so that you're not just grinding through material. You know this urgency to get done over and over, that that's the goal. Somehow we're gonna get done. There's some destination you're gonna to get to and you're gonna be done. By the way, it never comes. Um, even when they're in college, it never comes. I was just with my son who's a law student at Columbia. It never comes. Now we're talking about, uh-oh, what happens after law school? My two youngest are seniors in college this year. I'm like, uh-oh, what comes next? How am I gonna help them next? Johanna's already writing me. She's thinking about her next phase. What's gonna happen next? It never ends. So you better get good at process <laughs> because the dialogue, the thinking, the cognition that drives the next thing is what education is all about. Being a good thinker, being able to think richly and deeply. Home affords that in ways school can't even come close to approaching, not even close. School is so busy assessing, they avoid processing. Think of this, when your child writes a paper for you, 
Which stage of the paper do you see? How much of that process do you see? You see it from the time the child has the pencil in his hand or the computer in front of him to the first words scratched out across the page to what is free writing or rough drafting to the discussion for revision to the editing of the typos to the final version that you finally can read. You see every step of the way, including I'm bored. This is hard. Oh my gosh. I don't know what else to say. You see all that. What does a school teacher see? What does a school teacher see in the writing process? Nothing. Nothing. They see the paper at the end. And what do they assess? The end. You get to assess everything, which is both a blessing and a curse. I understand. But you actually can see this active mind engaging the writing process. You get to engage that. You get to help mold it and shape it. What does a teacher do? The kid struggles on his own. He fixes a few things. He tries to expand his ideas. He isn't sure if he's even using the format correctly. He turns it in and what does he get back? A grade and three or four cryptic notes passive voice, question mark, wiggly line, awkward. And that's supposed to help him be a better writer? Are you kidding me? You're with your kids all the time. You see it all going on. You get to engage the process of learning from start to finish every day. And that is infuriating to you. <laughs> you would much rather have a finished product that you can just give an A to and be done. I get it. It's tiring. But that is also the joy and unique privilege of homeschool. You get to be there for every stage of development, every aspect of the struggle till that brilliant, beautiful end point. And because you're a part of the whole process, you actually have a much better perspective of who your child is. Last night, Liam and I were chatting. He uh, recently did one of those psychological workups where he was testing to see what is his working memory? What is his processing speed? What's his IQ? What's his verbal comprehension? All those things as he's going off for his senior year of college considering grad school. And so he handed me the assessment and I went through and read it and it uses a lot of very educationalese kind of language, you know, very clinical psychological stuff. Psycho psychometry is what they call it, the measurement of somebody's psychoanalytics, you know. And, um, I got to the end and I said, does any of this surprise you? And he's like, no. I said, me either. I already know all of this about you. And he said, yeah, me too. And then I said, do you also feel like it's a miscalculation of who you are in a way too though? Because they're measuring you all the time against school. He goes, yeah. In fact, as we talked about it, we were noticing how homeschoolers are almost at a disadvantage in those environments because the only thing they know how to sort of quantify is the way a person responds to the traditional coercive environment of school. They don't really know what to do with someone who reads the instructions on a test and creatively reinterprets them for a challenge to himself as opposed to cooperating with the agenda for the sake of proving something. Did you just hear what I said? We're raising innovators. We're raising thinkers. You know, Noah has famously said, my oldest child who's now 30, when I was pushing so hard to prepare him from college and he just wasn't interested and he finally said, mom, you raised me in an unconventional way. And now you want me to be a conventional adult? Boom, boom. How much courage does it take to do this? To buck this huge system that is constantly telling us you're not measuring up. So just opt out, say no. Don't welcome that, you know, classroom door, bell, sit in the chair, keep your butt in the seat, system into your beautiful home. They're not allowed in, don't let them in. Bar the door, <laughs> get your candle. <laughs> Tell them they have to go, cast a disenchanting spell on them. Have your tea.
Engage the brain. Refresh yourself. Do writing projects that take a month. You know, we have jot it down. You know, the fairy tale project everyone starts with. Pure delight. You read endless fairy tales. You watch the Disney films. You find fairy tales in other nations. You know, you read the Chinese Cinderella and the French Cinderella. And you just live in that world for a while. And you talk about it. Who has time for that in school? No one. They read Cinderella once. And they sort of talk about how Disney isn't the true Cinderella. No, we like live in Cinderella's world for as long as we want. Dress up clothes, Lego bricks, drawings, paintings, magic wands. We decide if we like the mice better than the fairy godmother. We, we do those things. And then after a season goes by, we're like, how can we represent this in a way that shows off? That just says, I'm going to show off everything I know about Cinderella. How do we do that? That's what narration is. Narration is showing off. It's not drumming out the information on command. It's, I'm an expert. I have a lot to say about this. Can't wait to tell you. How do we get more of that happening? I am so smart. I'm going to show you how fractions work. Not, well, mom, I finished the fractions page. How do we get more of that? Liam was saying last night when we were talking, he remembers, this is so cool to me, he remembers at a very young age thinking, people know how to read. I, I don't know how to do that. That looks so cool. That's what I want. I want to read. It looks so cool. Well, in our family, it was cool. That's all we ever do is read. We read books. We read web pages. We read text. We read, 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 read. We were readers. <laughs> he wanted in on that action. So... I started using alphabet letters. We played slapjack with alphabet cards. We had refrigerator magnets. We had a puzzle where you could assemble all of the alphabet in order using a puzzle. He loved puzzles. When we were driving down the highway and we saw billboards, we always read the billboards aloud and we made fun of them, critiqued them, honored them, you know, how you do. I mean, I don't know if you do that, but that's what our wordy family does all the time. We're very cynical, very snarky. We always think we're superior to the ad campaigns that exist on billboards, all of us, collectively, because snark makes you feel smart. Snark means you think you're smarter than somebody else. That's a huge invitation to a five-year-old. I want to be good enough to be snarky. I want to get in on the pun jokes. So Liam remembers before reading, thinking, I want to get in on that. He was my earliest reader. I told him, I remember when he read. We had worked on, you know, just basic phonics, mostly without a program, because he was my fourth child, and I didn't have time. <laughs> so we just played, 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 played with alphabets and talked, and we did explode the code, I think. That was my nod to official phonics training. And then one day, I was in bed with my husband, and Liam knocks on the door at 11 p.m. He had already been in bed for two hours, and he walks in. He goes, Mom, gap, G-A-P, gap. <laughs> he walks out, went back to bed. I looked at John. I'm like, what do you think that was? Is he reading? I was like, maybe. I went into the hall and there was a gap bag. And I was like, oh, oh, no, he's not reading. He just recognizes the letters. He knows the bag. He's not reading. A couple days later, he told this story to me last night. I knew the end part of it, but not the beginning. He said a couple days later, he was like, well, I want to read. Everybody's reading. So he went and he got this reader book that was in our book of, of, you know, early readers. And he took it upstairs and he locked his door and he sat down and he worked on it till he could read the whole thing. And I didn't know that part happened. The next morning he came down to breakfast and he said, Mom, I can read this book. Now we had not even done a sounding out book together yet, like Hop on Pop or any of the Bob books. And I, knowing by fourth child, you just take your child at their word. You don't say, oh, honey, you can't read. You say, oh, read the book to me. We sat down, he read the book cover to cover, and I called my husband at the office, and I'm like, dude, the kid is reading. He spelled gap two nights ago. Today, he read a whole book, and he never looked back. I'm sharing that story this morning because sometimes that's what homeschool looks like. Don't feel robbed if your children learn without you. You are creating an environment for learning to take place. 
Don't feel ripped off. You don't have to be the person who makes the spark happen. You can just put out the firewood and kindling and they might get their own flint going. Some kids need the book of matches. Some need a freaking flame torch, but others are going to respond to your environment. And whatever is the strongest in your family culture, that's what's going to be naturally appropriated in your children. Celebrate that. Don't buy a book for it. <laughs> Lean into it. Enjoy it. Live it. Be it. Make sense? Ah, oh, this is really fun. Well, good. I think this looks really good. I don't have any um, help today, so nobody posted any links like we usually do to help you. But I want to just finish by just showcasing a few Brave Writery products because hello, it's September. Some of you like me are procrastinators and you probably are still thinking, well, which thing do I need? I get this call every day, so I'm just gonna answer this question right now. If you've got a group of children and you're like, where do I start with Brave Writer? Aim for the middle and buy a bundle. You want a language arts tool like something that teaches like the arrow that goes with these books. The language arts tool teaches mechanics and literary craft, and you read a book. So it's living literature and mechanics in one. That's the arrow, the wand, the quiver of arrows, the pouch of boomerangs, the boomerang. There is one for every grade level, but you might have four grade levels. Do not teach all four. Try to aim for the middle so that you get like the arrow, and then you can shorten the passage for your younger kids, lengthen it for the older kids. The teaching is all the same. You can talk about nouns with PhDs, or kindergartners, don't worry so much about whether we're dealing with nouns at the appropriate level. Don't worry about it. Just talk about them, discuss them, have a group learning around the information in the arrow or the boomerang or the pouch, whatever you're doing, okay? Promise me. That's the language arts piece. The next part of the bundle, of course, is the writer's jungle. And here's what it looks like, this behemoth. It's massive, it's over 200 pages. Holy smokes, you don't want to start with that. That feels overwhelming. I get it. So don't. So don't. Save it. Feather it in. Read a chapter and then try to do what's in it. And then don't do the next chapter until you're ready to read another chapter and then do what's in it. But this is an awesome program. What does it do? It helps you teach writing voice and process to your kids. The very thing you get to participate in that the school teacher never sees you're going to know how to do it the way they aren't doing it at school. You're going to be so awesome because you're going to know even though they don't. And then finally, the third part of the bundle is going to be one of these products that teaches writing projects. We have Jot It Down, Partnership Writing, and Faltering Ownership. There are between 10 and 12 writing projects, one per month. They have four weeks worth of instructions. You only need to do four to six in a year at the most. If you get through two or three and have a great time, I'm gonna high five you and buy you ice cream, okay? Here's the point. The three things you want happening in your life, simultaneously, where you start with one and then eventually feather the others in, is some reading aloud, some focus on mechanics and handwriting. So that's one thing. Then you want some original writing process where kids are learning to access the language inside and get them out. And then you want a project, which is things like a lap book, narration, writing a letter, anything that is a product, you know, a writing project. That's all writing is, those three pieces. But most programs say write a descriptive paragraph and they expect you to do all three at once to that prompt. And kids look at you and they're like, but I don't know how. I don't know what to say, I don't know how to do it. The Writer's Jungle helps you know how, and the other two products show you what to do. You got it? So buy a bundle, aim for the middle. Go for the middle age, do not buy all three levels of everything, you'll drive yourself crazy. Nobody can do 30 writing projects in a year. If you have three kids, that's 30 projects in a year. There's no homeschooler doing that, so just relax. <laughs> Collaborate, do some things together, get your feet wet, start the conversation, make it homey. Okay? We got it? Everybody got it? Good. Yay. Thank you for posting a link to the store. You are adorable, Renee. 
you get my high five and virtual ice cream of the day. I appreciate it. So I hope that helped everyone. Thanks for tuning in. It has been an hour. I'm going to let you all go. I am so jealous. Let me just end on that note. This is my very last year of having officially schooled kids. My law student will graduate and both my seniors in college will graduate in the spring. I've already bawled about it. I so miss the homeschooling years. I'm so grateful I get to stay connected through you. I want to just remind you that at the other end, amazing human beings await you to take you out to brunch in Bryant Square in New York. So keep going. It's so worth the journey. I love you all. Live honestly, write bravely. I'm Julie Bogart from Brave Writer. Happy 2017-2018 school year to all of you. Happy home year. Bye, everyone.